he kind of has a Zachariah Sitchin view of the whole thing. That is that he believes that it's called Nibiru, that the Sumerians talked about it, that Zachariah Sitchin's uh, translations of the Sumerian texts are more or less accurate. He differs from Zachariah Sitchin in that he thinks it's going to be here, you know, depending on when you ask him, and just after 2012, 2013, somewhere in the in the near future. So that's kind of where he's at from it. With it, also he differs in Sitchin in that he thinks it is a binary star system, not a planet. So he thinks it's a brown or red dwarf star. So I'm just going to first talk about that issue with Sitchin. A lot of people believe in Nibiru or some version of that. It's really important that you know that the entire thing is, as far as Sitchin goes, we now know that the guy didn't even know the basics of Sumerian art, let alone the language. Of course, uh, Michael Heiser and his excellent website, SitchinIsWrong.com, goes through this much more meticulously than I'm about to here. But just a few things on it. The, the main thing is from this, what they call a cylinder seal, which is something that, uh, like a Sumerian carving. And it's got a picture of what looks like, what Sitchin says is the, the sun and a bunch of planets around it. He essentially says that the Sumerians therefore knew that there were more planets than there actually are, one of which is Nibiru. Now, this thing is refuted pretty simply, and Heiser goes through it on his uh, on his site. The Sumerians, like, never would draw the sun, like a thing in the middle there that he says is the sun, i.e. the solar system. The Sumerians, this would constitute the first time in history that the Sumerians drew the sun like that. And it's not as though the Sumerians were like wishy-washy about how they depicted the sun. You got to remember they worshipped the sun. The sun was Shamash. I mean, the sun appeared in almost every Sumerian relief, and it was depicted either one of two ways. One of which was um, like a, a circle with some squiggly lines in it, and uh, very many examples in that. And another one is, especially in the later times, towards the Assyrian times and a little before that, is the solar disk. But we could go through many different ways to show that that solar disk was referring to Shamash, the sun god. We could go into detail, and Heiser goes into much more detail. I don't want to spend too much time on that because it's a radio show, and I could, I'm not really going to be showing you pictures here. But I w do want to mention a few things about Nibiru in, in terms of their texts. Now, nobody could have done this when Sitchin was writing his books in the 70s and 80s, but nowadays we can do a word search in the Sumerian for every instance of the word Nibiru. Every tablet that is known, like millions of these tablets, right? It took 90 years, but what they did was they took every word that's ever been mentioned in every tablet and they cataloged it, okay? So, again, this is a massive project, the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, CAD, the Oriental Institute, you can find their, their this online. Okay, so there's maybe... Out of all these texts, of all the possible mentions of this word Nibiru, I think it's something like 20 times is the thing mentioned? 20 times, okay? So we can look at every single instance that this word was used. Keep in mind, this was impossible at the time for the common man to do this unless they were like at the university, you know, where, the, where these cards were. So Sitchin knew he could get away with lying about what Nibiru was because he knew nobody would look it up or couldn't look it up. But nowadays we can look it up. And there is not a single text that has Nibiru as a planet beyond Pluto. There is not a single text in all those words that connects Nibiru with the Anunnaki. It never says, and the Anunnaki went to Nibiru or Nibiru. And the, there's, there's just no association with the two. Complete and total lie on the part of Sitchin. The idea that Nibiru has, is cycling around the solar system every 3,600 years is a total fabrication. There's no other way around it. The guy just made it up. He knew you wouldn't be able to figure it out, so he made it up. In fact, the way that they talk of Nibiru, it's there every year. I mean, it totally destroys Sitchin's thing. What they believe Nibiru was, was around every year. And the reason I'm not being exactly direct in what they believed it was is because there is a little bit of debate about what the Sumerians believed Nibiru was. The reason is is because they refer to it pretty much for as three different things. Like, But to, I don't want to confuse you because you're going to think, oh, well, the confusion is, is because it's a, a planet from the whatever, whatever. But it, the confusion has nothing to do with it possibly being, you know, what Sitchin is saying. What I mean is that almost every instance they call it Jupiter. It's unambiguously Marduk. It's Jupiter. But 
on one occasion it calls it Mercury. And again, they, they knew what Mercury was. They knew they knew what Jupiter was, and that's what they were calling Nibiru. But then there's an occasion where it calls it a star. And the way it speaks of it, it seems as if they're talking about a pole star, which, of course, if you know anything about precession, our, like our North Star, the reason it's the North Star is because of the way precession is right now, but it won't always be the North Star. It'll continually change. So Heiser takes the view that it is probably a, a pole star because of the way they speak of it. And like I said, it's there every year. But I don't want to go into too much detail because it's really just unnecessary. What you need to know is that it has nothing to do with 3,600 years. It has nothing to do with the Anunnaki. It never speaks of it as like a planet that's beyond Pluto. I mean, at the very least, it's what they knew to be Jupiter and what they knew to be Mercury. So it's a complete fa fabrication on that stuff. And you can look at Heiser's paper on that for much more detailed information about what I just talked about. Okay, so the idea, of course, about Planet X, and this depends on who you're hearing it from, Marshall Masters says that by 2012, we're going to see two suns in the sky. So he thinks this is a binary star system. Now, one of the things that the guy always says is that NASA believes 80% of the universe is binary stars. And that's true. I mean, that's like the one true thing the guy says is, yeah, there, there are mostly binary star systems. Binary star systems are essentially two suns per solar system. Sometimes they have their own planets for each star and stuff like that, but there's lots of different variations. And yeah, there we are unique if we're not, but not that unique, like 20% don't have binary star, star systems. So it's not like we're really unique, but yeah, we are a little unique if we don't have a binary star. But and NASA and other scientists, they still haven't discounted the possibility that we're part of a binary star system. But the difference between everybody else in Marshall Masters or anybody else that, that kind of believes this way is that when they speak of us possibly being a binary star system, they're speaking of it being anywhere from 25,000 to 95,000 AU, that's Earth to Sun distances, away from from us. I mean, that's like, I mean, an amazingly far distance from us. And, of course, it would have to be that far distance for it to go unnoticed. And that brings me to my next point. And we'll talk about Nemesis more and what that means here in a second. My next point is, I, I talked a lot about this in the, in the last episode, so I will only briefly touch on it, is lack of gravitational effects. If there was a supermassive or even just kind of massive object even approaching our solar system, we would know it. I have a little bit more information about what I was talking about last time. With amateur astronomers and everybody else, they know the planets are where they're supposed to be because of the consistency of our solar system. Everything's doing what it's supposed to be doing in our solar system. That's why astronomy programs are perfectly accurate. That's why when NASA sends a satellite to intercept a comet and all this other stuff that it does, it seems like impossible. It all works because everything's doing what it's supposed to be doing, essentially. Planets are where they're supposed to be based on their mass and other you know, laws of planetary motion and stuff like that. Now, I talked a little bit about the history of that before, and I'll mention it briefly. But if an object comes in our solar system, it will mess that up. Even if it messed it up just a little bit, it would be immediately noticeable, not just to NASA. We don't have to wait on NASA for this. This would be something that every amateur astronomer in the field would tell you about the next day. If all of a sudden the astronomy programs are off, or you know, they're always looking for something called occultations, that passes in front of an object, like you can study a star or something else that's really far away um, a lot better if you wait till a planet gets in front of it, and then as those moments when it starts to appear out from the backside of a planet, you can actually see stuff that you wouldn't normally have seen. So it's a really important part, a, a thing that amateur astronomers do, and none of that would, of course, work if the planets weren't where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be. So... The minute that they're not where they're supposed to be, everybody would know it. And the minute that an object comes even kind of, kind of, sort of, kind of close to us, that won't be that way. Mike Brown, the guy who um, was instrumental in demoting Pluto as a planet, said the following, There are very good limits as to what you can hide 
at what distances in the solar system and not detect their gravity. You could put a Mars a few hundred AU, which is 10 times more distant than Neptune, 10 times bigger than our solar system, 